With a 2-1 lead in the opening round of the 1999 NBA playoffs, the Sacramento Kings found themselves one win away with home court advantage of knocking off the veteran Utah Jazz and advancing to the next round. But that's when the experience of the Utah Jazz came to play, and especially the heroics of John Stockton make this series already more dramatic and interesting than it was to that point. We're going to discuss what happened in Game 4 and Game 5, the perfect ending to this series on the final part of this three-part in-depth dive into the 1999 Kings Jazz Series on the Locked on Kings podcast. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Of Locked on Kings. Hello and welcome to Locked on Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all regular season and all off season. If you're looking for in-depth analysis, game-by-game breakdowns, highlights, interviews with local and national experts, full coverage of your Sacramento Kings from January through December, this is the place for you, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Today's episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Visit rockauto.com and tell them Locked On sent you. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I've been a Sacramento sports media member, Sacramento Kings media member for the last seven years. This will be my eighth season covering the Kings, formerly in radio, now in television at ABC 10 here in Sacktown. And I've had a lot of fun putting together this three-part series uh, on the 1999 playoffs and this Kings versus Jazz rivalry uh, that quickly formed during that uh, 1998-1999 lockout shortened season. It's already been very dramatic to this point. If you haven't checked out part one, which covered uh, the regular season meetings and game one and part two that covered games two and three, uh, I encourage you to go back and do that and pause right now before we dive in depth uh, into part uh, three with games four and games five. Of course, as uh, in the last two parts, the G-man Gary Gerald, Sacramento Kings radio broadcaster, longtime radio announcer of the Kings, who called the games uh, back during this series in 1999, he will join me here on Locked on Kings at the end of the podcast to share his memories, his thoughts on games four, games five, uh, and the series as a whole. Also, I will be announcing the winner of my NBA 2K22 giveaway at the end of this podcast, so make sure you stick around for that. But to briefly recap, and again, last chance for you to pause and listen to part one and part two because it's a lot more interesting than me just spoiling everything for you here. All right, that was enough time for you to pause uh, and to, to listen back. To recap, the Sacramento Kings and Utah Jazz met three times During the regular season, Uh, the Kings went one and two against the Jazz, but all three of those games went to overtime. All three of those games had altercations. There were ejections uh, in in one of the games as well. Uh, So this rivalry was formed pretty quickly, and it was only fitting that the three-seed Utah Jazz and the six-seed Sacramento Kings, who are a brand-new all-look team this time uh, with Rick Adelman, uh, Chris Weber's first season, Peja Stojakovic's first season, season, Jason Williams first season, Vladi Divac's first season. It was a very, very new Sacramento Kings team that led the Kings to the playoffs for the first time in a, a couple of years since the Kings were eliminated by the Seattle Supersonics. So uh, that they get into the playoffs. It's a perfect matchup with the Utah Jazz based off of how the regular season has gone. And they take on the Jazz in game one in Utah and get absolutely beat down. They lose by 30 points to the Utah Jazz in Utah. Game two has the famous moment at the beginning of the game of Chris Weber sending a message to John Stockton uh, and the rest of the Utah Jazz team and really the rest of the NBA that the Kings weren't going to be pushovers and weren't going to be blown out like they were in game one. He said... Chris Weber said before the game that he was embarrassed. He did something about it, shoulder checking John Stockton as he cut to the lane early on. That message really stuck uh, and energized the Sacramento Kings to defeat the Utah Jazz in game two and to defeat the Utah Jazz in game three, which was the first game in Sacramento. That also happened to be the first Sacramento home playoff victory Uh, in the franchise's history here in the California capital. So the Kings have a 2-1 lead, and that's where we will pick up. Game four, also in Sacramento. Suddenly the Kings 
have home court advantage. They need one more win uh, to advance. And, and I can't understate the significance of this. We're talking a young Kings team who is led by a young star in Chris Webber, but a new Kings team taking on one of the most established duos in Stockton and Malone with a very veteran heavy uh, Utah Jazz team coached by Jerry Sloan. I mean, this was a big deal for the Kings to, to be up on the Utah Jazz like this, especially after how game one went and how the regular season went. Two straight wins over the Utah Jazz, one win away from advancing. That had a, or caught a lot of people off guard, uh, caught a lot of attention at that time. In the headlines, you can go back and read articles leading into game four and really after game three, and you can see really the shock around the NBA world. Some of those headlines, pretty entertaining to watch. And game four goes about as you expected. About, I mean, the rest of the series, games four and game five, go like as if they were written perfectly, right? It's like the perfect drama. Sports just has a way of doing that. In game four, this game is neck and neck from start to finish. 17 ties in this game, 30 lead changes, 30 lead changes in this battle between the Kings and the Utah Jazz. The Jazz backs against the wall in hostile territory. The Kings, the young, exciting team in front of their home crowd, uh, all the momentum on their side. And the Kings would lead for 32 minutes of this 48-minute game. Just because there were 30 lean changes doesn't mean the Kings weren't on top for the majority of the game. Again, it went back and forth, a lot of lead changes, especially early on, but Sacramento was in control, even by a small margin for the majority of the game. But the game is essentially the Kings versus Stockton and Malone in this one. Like there was very little help from anybody else on the Utah Jazz. It was Stockton and Malone versus the Sacramento Kings roster. Malone and Stockton combined for 45 of Utah's 90 points. 16 uh, of those points also came uh, from Shandon Anderson off of the bench. No other Jazz pet player finished in double figures. So really it's the Kings versus Stockton, Malone, and Anderson. That was the uh, that was the way this game went. Defensively, Sacramento did well, and those other guys, it's very difficult to stop Carl Malone, and he always uh, was getting his number. But the Kings, once again, come out of the gate red hot offensively, just like they did in games two uh, and game three. They shot 53% from the field in the first quarter. But unfortunately, that percentage starts dropping. They shoot in the 20s in the second quarter. And then in the fourth quarter, they shoot just 33%. The Utah Jazz, meanwhile, got better as the game went on. And in the fourth quarter, they were unstoppable. The Kings couldn't find an answer for them on the inside. They shot 61%. Carl Malone had just one made field goal outside of the paint in the fourth quarter. Staunton had three, including the big one that we're going to talk about here uh, in just a second. If you're familiar with game four, you know what happens. The lead changed five times in the final 30 seconds. That's how back and forth this game was between these two teams. And Vlade Divac, once again, was trying to be the hero and step up for the Kings. He was huge in game three, um, really instrumental in the Kings winning game three. He was also very big in game two. Chris Webber led the Kings in game two, though. But game three was all Vlade Divac, especially after Chris Webber fouled out at the end of the game. And Vlade actually secured the win for the Sacramento Kings. Uh, so he was the big guy again. He was the go-to hand uh, in the clutch. He scored the final seven points for the Sacramento Kings in the fourth quarter to give them the lead and the chance to win this game. Vlade hits two free throws with an 88 to eight or to give the Kings an 89 to 88 lead with just seven seconds remaining. But that's when John Stockton really steps up after just scoring five points the game before. Remember John Stockton had a terrible, terrible game three Kings did a really good job defensively against him. And he never really got into his rhythm. He gets his revenge against the Sacramento Kings for that poor performance. And he also gets his revenge over Chris Weber for the message sent and getting knocked down in game two, as he hits a game winning 22 footer off of a beautiful Carl Malone screen. And that evens the series at two games apiece. So it's 2-2. Two, two. It's going back to Utah for sudden death. Winner go home. Game five. Chris Webber scores 18 points. Has 11 rebounds in this game. Uh, Vlade Divac, 14 points, 14 rebounds. But did have six turnovers. He struggled to take care of the basketball as he was harassed on the inside. Corliss Williamson, uh, Williamson provide 12 points. Vernon Maxwell, 13 points off the bench. And Vernon Maxwell was huge in game five, but was big throughout this entire series. Uh, and I mean, you're going to hear me talk to G-Man about this a little bit later on in the podcast, but there are some eerie parallels to this series and to the 2002 series. Now, different stakes, uh, different amount of games, obviously different opponent in the Los Angeles Lakers, but 
Uh, the, the John Stockton game winner when the Kings really had a chance to end the series right then and there, similar to the Robert Ori game winner. I'm going to talk to G-Man about that a little long uh, later on. But there were a lot of parallels that I drew with this series uh, with future moments of the Sacramento Kings, not just during that playoff run that they went on, but also modern day. Uh, G-Man and I will discuss that a little bit later on. So we go to game five, May 16th, 1999. The Utah Jazz survived back-to-back games in Sacramento where they trailed for a majority of the game. And you could see from the get-go in this game, there was a clear determination to correct that at home. And before we dive more into this Game 5, I want to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by Built Bar, the best-tasting protein bar on the planet. Built Bar has amazing flavors like coconut, raspberry, my favorite is mint brownie, also double chocolate, salted caramel, strawberry, and so many more. These bars are uh, covered in 100% chocolate. They're soft, they're easy to chew, and they're delicious. They're literally protein bars that taste like candy bars. You're going to feel like you're eating a, a Hershey's bar or a um, I mean, whatever your favorite candy bar is, like a Baby Ruth bar or a Butterfinger, it, it's the exact same in terms of taste. You feel like you're just tasting a big block of yummy, delicious sugar and chocolate, but you're not. You're eating a healthy protein bar, 17 to 18 grams of protein, calories ranging from 130 to 180, only four to five grams of sugar, and only four to five grams of net carbs. Amazing flavors, all tasty and all healthy. Go to built.com and order your first box today. I recommend ordering a mixed box. They'll send you a bunch of different types of flavors for you to try. And then after you find your favorite flavors, which you definitely will, uh, you then go back to built.com and you can build your own box and pick the flavors that you want to have sent to you. When you go to built.com, make sure you use promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your order. Again, that's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. So like I said, game five in Utah and the Jazz trying to correct their big mistakes in games two and three when they, and even game four, when they were playing from behind and allowed the Sacramento Kings uh, to be in control and play their game. And they were kind of playing catch up, which is an unusual position for the Utah Jazz to be in, especially the higher seed, the more veteran team against a younger team like the Sacramento Kings. And watching this game from the get go, it was very clear who the veteran team was in a different way from game one. The Utah Jazz in game one came out and just punched the Kings in the mouth, right? It looked like the Jazz knew what they were doing. They looked comfortable and the Kings looked frazzled. In this game five, the Kings were ready. The Kings were playing well, but the Utah Jazz just seemed calm. They were composed. They understood what they were trying to do. They fed off the energy of their crowd, but didn't allow uh, them to to go over the top. They didn't get too excited. Uh, And to the Kings' credit, Really, neither did they. At this point, the Kings were used to this. They understood what it took to beat the Utah Jazz, especially uh, in Utah. So both teams were really on their A game, but you could see the composure of the Utah Jazz throughout this game. Jerry Sloan did an excellent job preparing Malone, Stockton, and the rest of this uh, Utah Jazz team for this Game 5. Really watching the game compared to the other games, uh, you can see just a, a comfort level. The Jazz looked a little frantic in Game 4, even though they were able to win that game, really steal that game in Sacramento. From the get-go of that game, you could tell that they they were playing maybe a little bit afraid, playing, uh, playing to avoid the embarrassment of being eliminated by the Sacramento Kings team. In this Game 5, it was there was obvious respect for the Sacramento Kings, but it was more, all right, now we're back in our building. All we have to do is beat this team one more time, and we've done that plenty of times already this season. We've done that now f- three times or four times, we can make it a fifth. We can handle this. Uh, and that, it, it just, w- that was very clear and very apparent to me watching this game five. But again, to the Kings credit, they didn't look outmatched. The Jazz just looked confident and composed in this game. There were six ties and six lead changes, but for the most part, the Jazz were in control. They led for 42 minutes of this one, and the Kings were playing catch up. There were a couple of times uh, where the Kings had to close gaps, and they were able to do so quickly when they could have folded and this game could have gotten ugly, like in game one. For example, Utah come out came out the gate just red hot offensively, and, and they were very physical with the Kings, and the Kings were struggling to have shots fall. Utah got off to a 16-3 to start, but to the Kings' credit, credit by the end of the first quarter and thanks to a 10-0 run early in the second quarter, 
suddenly they retook the lead. So the Kings were able to close that gap before that first 12 minute period was up. Then they opened up the second quarter uh, on a big run, really building that 10 0 run from the end of the first quarter. And the Kings go from 13 points down early on to suddenly having a, a lead early in the second quarter. And the game is back to normal. Now the jazz would also go on another run. Once again, go up double digits, force the Kings from play to play from behind and play catch up. The jazz were up double digits at halftime. Uh, and the lead gets up to 12 points at the highest in the third quarter. Uh, but heading to the fourth quarter, the Kings only trailed by five. So this is a game of runs. It's back and forth. The jazz make some separation. The Kings catch up. Up, take a small lead. Jazz create separation. The Kings fighting to catch up, and they're within striking distance heading into the fourth quarter. And then, once again, the Kings took the lead, but this time with 4.06 remaining in the game. So now you can see pressure and nervousness starting to set in with the Utah Jazz crowd. I'm not going to say with the Utah Jazz team themselves, although I'm sure there was some nerves uh, with them. But Carl Malone, John Stockton, the rest of that Jazz team, they still looked composed even when uh, the lead uh, evaporated and even when they lost the lead, they were quickly able to tie it up with 88 seconds or no at 88. I'm sorry, with 48 seconds remaining. Uh, and at that point, nobody else would score. So for the final 48 seconds, multiple possessions for each team to try and hit the game winner uh, and neither were able to do so. Vladi Divac had the last shot of the game. Uh, a hook shot, a good look, but he missed a game-winning hook shot. And of course, fitting, uh, you couldn't write this better, the Kings and the Jazz in Game 5 goes to overtime. So this is the second time in the series the Kings and Jazz go to overtime, Game 3 and now Game 5, but it is the fifth time this season, including the three regular season matches, that this game goes to overtime. Of course it had to. There was no other way that this was going to go, and this is where that Jazz composure uh, really kicks in. They got to the foul line. They scored seven unanswered points during overtime to create separation, uh, and just like that, the Kings season comes to an end as they lose to the Utah Jazz 99-92. to The Jazz would advance uh, to the next round of the series. It was a balanced scoring game from the Jazz. It wasn't just one guy doing it all, though Carl Malone, once again, is at the top. Unlike the two sack games, though, uh, he had a lot more help than what he had in those two games. Carl Malone finished with 20 points. Hornacek uh, finished with 18. Russell had 16. Anderson also had 16 after a great game four. John Stockton had 12 points, but 14 assists, doing what Stockton does best, completely outplaying Jason Williams in the final few games of this series. Speaking of Jason Williams, he had just two points and three assists in this game. Only played about 22, 23 minutes. You could see the stage was a little big for him. Uh, and also, I mean, matching up with a, a point guard of the caliber of John Stockton as a rookie in a elimination game in the playoffs. That's a tough ask uh, for a young player like Jay Will. Chris Weber only had 12 points, really struggled from the field in this game when the Kings needed him to step up more. Shot five of 17, but did have 14 rebounds. Uh, Vladi Divac, another strong performance, 15 points and 10 rebounds for him on the inside. And Vernon Maxwell was really the reason why the Kings were able to get back into this game twice and had a chance at the end. Uh, he provided 22 points off of the bench. So the Sacramento Kings, they lose the series but they win respect around the NBA. Not just respect the Utah Jazz, but respect of everybody watching. And this would, as you know, become the, the start of a glorious eight-year playoff run, the greatest era, not just of Sacramento Kings basketball, but maybe of, of Kings basketball period uh, throughout the franchise history. Now, I'm aware they did win a, a NBA championship years upon years upon years ago when they were the Rochester Royals, but that eight-year era... Uh, as we know, it was very, very special with those Kings teams. And this series really started that. Now, the Utah Jazz would advance, like I said, to the next round. They would take on the Portland Trail Blazers, and they would lose in that series 4-2 to two in a normal seven-game or best-of-seven series. And in the end, the San Antonio Spurs would beat the New York Knicks to win the NBA championship. And what's cool about that is uh, the New York Knicks were actually the eighth seed in the Western Conference, and they made it all the way to the NBA Finals only to lose to the San Antonio Spurs. The Kings and the Jazz would meet up in game three of the following season. Uh, so regular season, the Kings are, are trying to uh, build off of the momentum of that last year. And boy, did they in their first meeting against Utah. They defeated the Jazz 105-92, getting a little bit of revenge. Again, that's just the third game of that next season. And it was one of their nine wins in a 9-1 and one start. So the Kings come out of the gate in the, or the 1999-2000 season absolutely on fire, proving that last season that young team was not just a fluke. 
And then the Kings and Jazz would meet two more times in two different playoff series over the years. They defeated the Jazz 3-1 to one in the opening round of the 2001-2002 playoffs. And then in the 2002-2003 playoffs, the Kings would play the Jazz again in the opening round, except at this time, it was then switched to a best-of-seven series. So no longer was it a best-of-five, and the Kings beat the Jazz 4-1 to one in that opening round. So in the other two series, the Kings uh, handled their business well against Utah. Uh, really, that was the end of the decline line of the uh, the Stockton Malone era and the rise of those Sacramento Kings that we know and love. So that rivalry became something very, very special, something that I don't think we talk enough about historically, especially with the rivalry between the Kings uh, and the, the Los Angeles Lakers. And the Kings had some good rivalries at the time. They had a short rivalry with the Minnesota Timberwolves and Kevin Garnett. They had a short rivalry with like Tim Duncan and Michael Finley and, and um, the San Antonio Spurs team. They had a good rivalry with the Steve Nash, Dirk Nowitzki, um, Dallas Mavericks, of course, a rivalry with the older um, uh, Seattle Supersonics teams. But really, in terms of like grading rivalries or putting it on a tier, there's Kings Lakers, obviously, at the A tier at the top. And then to me, the next rung on that ladder, the next tier is Kings and Utah Jazz with how physical this series got and how entertaining this series was in 1999. Coming up next, I'm going to be talking with the G-Man, Gary Gerald, his final thoughts on this series, talking about games four and five. You're going to hear that in just a second. Right now, though, I want to let you know that today's episode of Locked on Kings is brought to you by our title sponsor today, Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts that you need. And why endure pointless or intimidating questioning and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, choosing only the brands that their warehouse happens to carry at their fixed prices? You have computers. You have access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. You can use rockauto.com to save you time and money. Why would you choose to spend 30, 50, or even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store or car dealership? Rock Auto is a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. Rock Auto's prices are reliably low for every customer, variety of different parts at different price points. Uh, for your needs, you can go and explore their easy-to-use website today and find the solution to your auto parts needs right now. When you go to rockauto.com and see all the parts available for your car or truck, make sure you write locked on in there, how did you hear about us box, so they know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. RockAuto.com. Locked on Kings is also brought to you by BetOnline.ag. They are back for football and better than ever. All eyes are on the gridiron as teams are back to start another NFL and NCAA season. As always, BetOnline is your number one spot for all the pro and college football action this season. With a new updated site and interface, even more odds, props, and contests, BetOnline.ag continues to be the number one source for everything football. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today to receive a 100% welcome bonus that's double your initial deposit just for signing up. Don't forget to use promo code NFL100 to cash in on that deal. From football to basketball, boxing, right to your favorite Vegas casino games, don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season at Bet Online, your online sportsbook experts. So you're the worst seed. You have a 2-1 lead. You have home court advantage with game four in Sacramento. And we talked a little bit earlier about a five-game opening uh round of the playoffs what did you think about that format thinking about it now as we immediately go into the seven game format do you prefer or like that five game format at all and how much more intense and meaningful did it make each game especially those early games uh because there were it was really just best of three or best was, of five but you had to get three yeah, wins it, it was it was different but we didn't know any different at that point and we didn't know what it might be like to have a seven-game series as opposed to a five-game series. So you knew, obviously, that there wasn't, again, there was very little margin for error. You had to take advantage of every opportunity. Uh, in hindsight, when you look back and you say, probably, I have kind of mixed feelings, but I think that I like the fact that everything is a seven-game series now, or a best of seven, I should say. Uh, that made it, I mean, there's a little bit of a forgiveness factor. You don't ever want to think negatively in those situations, but if you do, you know, have one of those inexplicable nights when shots don't fall or somebody makes a critical mistake at a critical time, you feel like you got a chance to atone for it. Game four is probably the most famous or, or thought of game 
out of this five game series and not because of a Kings reason. Uh, John Stockton has a, a game winner that broke the hearts of Kings fans. Uh, this finish was wild. I remember just rewatching it recently, even being on the edge of my seat, even though I knew uh, the result of it. I mean, Vernon Maxwell gives the Kings an 81 to 76 lead with a couple minutes left. Fans think the Kings are going to win and, and move on to the next round. Then all of a sudden uh, the Jazz come back. Uh, Carl Malone hits a layup to put uh, the Jazz up by one with 13 seconds remaining. Then Vlade is fouled. He goes to the line, hits two free throws. The Kings are back right. up one. There's seven seconds remaining. And then John Stockton hits a foot on the line coming off of a Malone screen jumper. Uh, the buzzer didn't sound. There was like 0 0.7 seconds or something like that. But it very much was the game winner. And John Stockton, the, the old guy, sticking it to the young uh, in many, uh, very many ways there. That sequence, just crazy. I, I I think I watched three or four straight Kings possessions of Weber and Vlade in the post. That's just the way the game was played at that time. So for Stockton to have a game winning deep jumper looks more modern than, than it did mm -hmm. uh, back at that time. But that entire sequence, that finish sucking the air out of the building, that message that the jazz then returned to the Sacramento Kings, the sucker punch back to Weber in a way. Uh, what did you think of that moment? And what do you remember about just that epic finish to game four? It was crushing, uh, no question about it. And and again, you look at Stockton, the old pro, and and you know delivering when they had to have that kind of a contribution. And and there he was, rising to the occasion. And and you use the term, you know, it sucked the energy out of the building. Absolutely. I mean, it was just like deflating to everyone. But you still knew you had a game five and you had an opportunity. You were going to have to go on the road. You were going to have to duplicate what you did in game number two of the series. So there's there's a sliver of hope in that sense. But in a short series like that, you just you don't have time, you know, to lick your wounds or whatever. You just got to ratchet it up and you got to grit it up and you got to say, OK, we're going. We got to go right now and we got to get it done. Uh, it was it was all part of a growing process. Uh, I've often felt, Matt, that teams who get into playoffs who haven't been in the playoffs for a long time, they they don't know what it's like in terms of the pressure and the intensity and the fact that you've got to take advantage of every opportunity and in the old cliche, every possession. It's literally the truth. So in this situation, it proved to be, I think, a giant learning step, because as I as I think back, I I'm not sure, but I think the next year, the Kings played Phoenix in the first round of the playoffs and beat the Suns to advance and take on the Lakers, and then they got throttled by the Lakers in a four game set, and then it set the stage. I think it was maybe then the following year that they got Utah again. And they were able to get, you know, to get that job accomplished, to get the mission accomplished. So it's a learning scenario and it, it's just a tough, but boy, for that fourth game, I mean, for the moment, it was just like, oh man, we've worked so hard. We've had such a good season and are we going to get knocked out in the first round? You had to, it was a lot, it was a lot to digest at that time. I'm sorry, Sacramento Kings fans, to open another old wound, especially one that's, that's as uh, raw still and festering today. It's at different stakes and significantly different circumstances, of course. But how do you compare that Stockton game winner and, and that moment to Robert Ory's game winner in, in 2002? Again, very different in terms of Western Conference Finals versus opening round. And, and both not, neither game was a decider game, but still big shots in the playoffs that the Kings found themselves at the wrong side of, and they ended up losing the series. Well, always in my mind, the Ori shot will be, will be much more uh, of a dagger uh, because you were in a position to take a three, one lead over the Lakers and really command the series. And it was on their floor in LA. And, you know, you think you have the game one with the misses at the rim. I think it was Kobe and Shaq were there and bloody sees the ball and the opportunity and flips it back and it goes right to Ori and as time expires, he, you know, he just, uh, he puts the dagger of all daggers right in the aorta. Uh, that one, that one still to this day uh, is so, so much anguish and so much pain. Stockton, 
did literally a similar type of thing, of course, but it was the first round. And it was, again, it was only the third time the Kings, as the Sacramento Kings, had been involved in playoff basketball. And so, you know, you didn't know a whole lot better. And at that time, as devastating as it was, to me, it pales in comparison to what Robert Ory did. And the fact that the Kings literally, instead of a 2-2 series, would have been up 3-1. And I, I don't think there's any question in my mind they would have been going to the NBA Finals and going against, at that time, what I conceived to be a much weaker final opponent in the New Jersey Nets. So it's, you know, water long gone under the bridge, but man, it's just, both of them hurt, but but the Laker one and Ori hurt more in my mind. It's just, it was, it was incredible to experience the parallels between the two series in so many ways uh, in some yeah. of this game. And of course, none of us, none of the Kings didn't have the context of 2002 when, right. uh, when this series was going on, that was going to be years in the future. Um, but so different circumstances, maybe different expectations with the Kings not being the favorite in that series, but to have a chance to win it at home for many to believe they were going to win it at home in advance than to have Stockton do that. It just, it felt eerily similar, even though, uh, it was, uh, in the past and not the future, but then game five goes back to Utah winner go home game. And the Kings knew they could have success in Utah. They'd beat the jazz once, uh, but Utah gets off to a really good start in this game. Kings were actually down by 10 at half, but you knew that's not how the game was going to wrap up no surprise that the kings came back even took a lead at one point uh midway through the fourth quarter i believe that was except for maybe very early on the first lead change in the game came around uh yeah. that fourth quarter time it was like the first or second or something like that the, the jazz led for the majority of this game and then of course g-man it has to go to overtime because of course it does the basketball <laughs> gods they'll, they'll give us uh, uh nothing nothing else but in the end, the Kings eliminated the Jazz, uh, proved to be the better team. They move on. Do you remember, what was the comparison of disappointment to overall feeling of optimism? Because, of course, like we talked about, the letdown, the Stockton game winner, Kings had a real chance to move on. No one likes to lose. But this is this Kings team first time in the playoffs, and they stick it to the Jazz that much, made it a real series, opened eyes around the league, not just in Sacramento. So was it more optimism, or was it, disappointment after that game or the just the vibe in Sacramento after that game five loss? Well, I think obviously there's immediate disappointment and there's a letdown, but I think everybody felt like with the talent that's been assembled, with the performance that we saw in the five games against the Jazz, the fact that it was a deciding overtime game, uh, there was there was so much optimism and it was like, hey, this this is a terrific foundation that's being built and, and we're just kind of scratching the surface here. And I, you know, I, it didn't take long for me and I, I think others to realize we're onto a good thing here. And there are, there are gonna be some, some good times ahead. Well, the Kings and Jazz, like you mentioned a little bit earlier, they would go on to have some more great regular season and postseason battles uh, in the, the 2002 playoffs. The Kings eliminated uh, the Utah Jazz in order to move on to then the Dallas Mavericks, a very tough series that I might honestly do another one of these specials just on that <laughs> Mavericks series. Uh, and then, of course, we know what happened uh, with the Lakers in the Western Conference Finals. But that 1999 series that so many Locked On Kings listeners requested I do this on, where do you rank that? amongst Kings playoff series in your memory? It doesn't have to be like top one, top two, top three, but when you think Kings playoffs, does 1999 come to mind quickly or do you have to maybe go back in the archives and the brain a little bit to remember the, the battles of the, uh, that playoff series? A little bit of both. Uh, the drama of the Lakers and, and the disappointment that we touched on is at the top of the list as far as I'm concerned. And then, you know, the atmosphere that related to uh, the Mitch Richmond days, the victory in Seattle in the first two games, even series coming home for game three. Richmond ends up getting hurt uh, late in the second half of that game, and the Kings' hopes kind of dissolved. Uh, that's certainly very high. But then you look at, yeah, maybe it's a little bit forgotten, this particular series in 99, but my goodness, the, the basketball of four of the five games that was played was just amazingly good. It was so intense. It was so physical. It was it was everything you want playoff basketball to be, other than game number one when the Jazz had that 30-point blowout victory. So uh, huge steps being made by the Kings, a lot of the, a lot of positive vibes being generated, 
and and in my mind, particularly when you when you take the time as you have done to kind of break the series down to reflect on just how impactful it was, uh, it was extraordinarily good. And I and I have to say that you know it was probably more in the recesses of my mind, but then when you start recalling how those games played out. You say, man, that was one heck of a playoff series. Good stuff. And I hope uh, Locked On Kings listeners who are able to experience it and watch it closely are, are reminded of some of those feelings and some of those memories. I personally uh, found myself getting oddly emotional watching some of these games because I could I could find similarities in um, in, in a bunch of things. We talked about the similarities of of the 2002 playoffs to the, that 1999 uh, series, but the hope and the optimism that that Kings team that nobody really had too many expectations for a new star and Chris Weber, a new rookie and Peja Stojakovic uh, and the uncertainties with that team, they get into the playoffs, they make a name for themselves. And then, like you said, they start that, uh, that eight straight seasons of playoff run. That was the golden era in Sacramento. It, it gives hope and optimism yes. for when this Kings team, I'm not going to say if, when this current <laughs> Kings team uh, makes the playoffs and how that can hopefully spark uh, a run that we all know the, the city of Sacramento is going to erupt for and that Kings fans and yourself, G-Man, who've been calling <laughs> games this entire time certainly deserve, my friend. Well, we, we look forward to it. And, and yes, and I think that when you look back and reflect on that series and on that particular time, it's a good reminder that things can pivot and change remarkably so uh, in a very short period of time. Now, yeah, it's been 15 years and we've been out there in the desert and we're still trying to find the oasis, but it's it's a good reminder that you get the right combination together, combination that begins to believe in themselves, that can play with physicality, that can be effectively effective defensively as well as on the offensive end, that you can become a lot more competitive. The Western Conference, the last time I looked, is still absolutely loaded going into a new season. It's not going to be easy, but there's hope. And that's, I, I love having the chance to look out there and envision hope and then finding a way to take advantage and, and make that hope become reality. It's very easy to daydream about Doko being filled before a playoff game and the Golden One Center absolutely cool. rocking too. Hopefully we'll, we'll get that sooner rather than later. G-Man, thank you for your insight. Thank you for your memories. Really appreciate it. Matt, you're amazing. And, and all of this different ways that you conjure up these things and you make it real. And uh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. It was a real treat to have Gary Gerald here for all three parts of this series, getting his insight and getting his context. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I hope you enjoyed this whole series as much as I did. Again, I wasn't planning on making this a series. Really only thought I was going to be doing like one episode on this. Uh, but this, uh, there's so much storytelling and there's so much to remember and reminisce and talk about uh, with this 1999 Kings Jazz series that I wanted to make sure I got it all in, making it a three-part series here. We are now looking ahead to training camp and preseason basketball is less than 10 days away. Can you believe that? So we're going to have uh, 2021, 2002 Kings basketball here before we know it. So when we come back next week, we're switching gears, getting rid of the past and talking about the future, looking forward to the future where hopefully this Kings team is making the playoffs like that young Kings team did in 1999 and ending this long, long, long playoff drought. I hope you will join me for all future Sacramento Kings content here on the Locked on Kings podcast. And it is time for me to announce the winner of our uh, NBA 2K22 giveaway. So many of you went onto Apple Podcasts and iTunes, uh, left reviews of the Locked on Kings podcast, sent them to me. I'm so, so grateful for all of you. I will be doing more giveaways like this in the future to reward you for your loyalty. Uh, so make sure you keep your screenshots of the um, of the reviews that you have left because I'll continue to use those as entry uh, into these giveaways. But as for this copy of NBA 2K22, uh, this was random, by the way. I didn't just pick this based off of my favorite review. I just totally put all these names on a wheel, actually a wheel application online. And the winner is Chase Gordon. Chase Gordon uh, leaving a great review. He says he discovered this podcast over the past summer and has listened to every new episode since. He says Matt does an excellent job of staying up to date on Kings news and keeps fans entertained even during the downtime of the NBA offseason. Being a Kings fan is one of the hardest challenges life can hand you, but this podcast will find a way to keep you engaged with your beloved team. So Chase, thank you for that fantastic review and congratulations. I will be in contact with you uh, very, very soon to uh, get all your information 
information and, and get that copy of NBA 2K22 over to you. Thank you to everybody else who entered. Again, make sure you keep those screenshots of those reviews uh, savvy and, and, and close uh, because I think I'm going to be doing some kind of like King's jersey giveaway or King's apparel giveaway. Uh, as we get close to the start of the regular season. And I would also like eventually uh, to give away tickets to an upcoming Kings game too, if I'm able to. So don't don't quote me on that, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make sure I do that and reward your guys' loyalty uh, this season. So I thank you so much for your reviews. Thank you so much for listening to this three-part 99 series. Can't wait uh, for you to join me on next week's Locked on Kings podcast as once again we get ready for next season until then. My name is Matt George. You have been listening to Locked on Kings, part of the Locked on Podcast Network.